After 10 years of denial, the SEC has finally given the crypto community what they wanted, and approved a spot Bitcoin ETF. This is a major milestone for the industry. It's the clearest sign yet of crypto's maturation and mainstreaming. It will undoubtedly bring sizable benefits to Bitcoin by opening the door for new kinds of users and expanding the asset's appeal. But could it also bring new risks? Could it even leave us wondering if we'd have been better off without it? In this video, I'll explore the potential benefits and risks of the new ETF. One of the biggest benefits of the ETFs is that they will make Bitcoin more accessible than ever before. But that may sound strange. Bitcoin has been publicly available since inception. Almost anybody could have signed on to Binance or Coinbase to buy Bitcoin for many years now. And in the really early days, you could mine it at home, or collect it for free from an online faucet. It's pretty difficult to be more accessible than that. However, financial professionals are extremely limited in what they can access and invest in. For instance, it's not unusual for broker-dealers to be limited to offering investments from a specially selected list of options. This list would be curated by their investment platform, based on various measures of suitability. Native Bitcoin would definitely not make that list. Indeed, it's unlikely that other TradFi Bitcoin products would make the list either. As a closed-end fund, GBTC had extremely high fees and did a poor job of tracking Bitcoin's price, while the futures ETFs aren't designed for long-term use and leak money month to month. As a result, this sizable segment of the TradFi world had no realistic option for accessing Bitcoin. And even those suffering from fewer limitations would have a hard time adding Bitcoin to their portfolios. After all, Bitcoin is very different to the assets that TradFi typically deals with. Compared to almost anything else, Bitcoin would be difficult to get a hold of, and even more difficult to safeguard once they had it. Consequently, it was likely to be ruled out for technical reasons or concerns about risk, even if there was an underlying desire to own it. All of this left Bitcoin stranded, separated almost entirely from the trillions of dollars locked in the TradFi world. Until the ETF. ETFs are an incredibly powerful, flexible wrapper that can accommodate almost any asset or basket of assets. They are extremely popular and heavily used throughout the TradFi world, and for good reason. They generally operate with very low fees, they reliably track the price of their underlying assets, and they tend to offer a great deal of convenience. That's especially true in the case of Bitcoin ETFs, as they eliminate any custodial concerns and make Bitcoin tradable on highly trusted TradFi exchanges. So, while native Bitcoin is difficult to deal with, presenting many challenges to potential investors, Bitcoin in an ETF acts just like any other asset that TradFi types are used to dealing with. That means it can slot into almost any portfolio without headaches or drama. Of course, the ETF wrapper won't instantly solve all accessibility issues. Bitcoin won't immediately appear on those curated list of investment options just because it's now in ETF form. It will take many months, years even, for most trading platforms to list Bitcoin as an investable asset for their clients. But the point is, it's now realistic to expect them to list Bitcoin. The biggest barriers to entry have been swept away. The bridge has been built between Bitcoin and the TradFi world, and that is the big unlock of the ETFs. And it's not just the professional investors that benefit here. Everyday, individual investors will benefit too. Anybody who was previously too scared to hold their own Bitcoin, or to sign up to shady, upstart crypto exchanges, will no longer need to do those things. Bitcoin will be available on the investment platforms that people already know, use, and trust. And the Bitcoin itself will be safely locked away with reliable and closely monitored custodians. For large groups of users, the ETF will be the way to gain Bitcoin exposure. For others, it may just be a stepping stone on the path to becoming a true crypto native. This is exactly what happened in the wake of Gold's ETF launch in the early 2000s. In the years that followed, ownership of physical gold also increased as people became more comfortable and familiar with the asset. In that case, the ETF gave rise to a new generation of gold bucks. I wouldn't take it as a given, but as the easiest, safest, and most convenient way to get started, the Bitcoin ETFs may just do the same thing for crypto. Increasing Bitcoin's accessibility is a win in its own right, but it will also bring second-order benefits. Now that TradFi types can see and easily access Bitcoin in a format that they are comfortable with, it will suddenly seem less alien, less scary. Previously, Bitcoin was something strange, potentially even dangerous, existing in the shadowy fringes of the financial system. It was easy to overlook, easy to disregard without a second thought. After all, why would somebody spend time considering and learning about Bitcoin if they couldn't realistically own it? It would be much easier to ignore it, and perhaps wave it away as a scam if the price suddenly increased. But now Bitcoin is an asset like any other. It's much less scary, less difficult to deal with, and harder to totally ignore. That doesn't mean every investor will now rush to buy Bitcoin. The ETFs don't inherently make Bitcoin more desirable or create new reasons to own it. They simply remove barriers to entry. They make it more difficult to immediately, automatically dismiss Bitcoin as an option. And that means more people need to actively consider and evaluate the asset. 
something they haven't needed to do in the past. Some will continue to reject Bitcoin after that. Others will find their opinions entirely transformed. NLW put it best in a recent episode of The Breakdown, explaining that the ETF launch provides a new context for people to re-evaluate Bitcoin in a new light. They will ask, is this really any worse or more risky than the things that I already own? Or could it, in fact, be a credible entry in a diversified portfolio? Having said that, the simple existence of a spot Bitcoin ETF is perhaps less impactful and beneficial than some might suggest. I don't believe an ETF launch is inherently a game-changing move for Bitcoin. There are all manner of weird and overlooked ETFs out there that are unattractive, unsuitable, or unavailable to most investors. A Bitcoin ETF could easily sit alongside those other niche products. If, for example, the only ETFs on the market were provided by crypto-native firms like Grayscale and Gemini, or even by the ever-optimistic and tech-forward ARK Invest, then the benefits would be somewhat muted compared to what we're seeing now. The launch just wouldn't pack the same punch. What makes this launch so special and so pivotal for Bitcoin's future is the fact that a string of massive financial companies were eager to have their Bitcoin ETF approved. Juggernauts like Fidelity, Franklin Templeton, and of course BlackRock have all launched their own Bitcoin products. What's more, in the run-up to the launch, they all engaged in a heated battle to make their ETF the best and most desirable, whether that was through cutting fees, special launch offers, or other marketing gimmicks. That is the sort of thing that will make skeptics reconsider. After all, these firms wouldn't want to associate themselves with an asset like Bitcoin if all of the worst rumours about it were true, much less would they scrabble and stampede to become a market leader, the TradFi face of Bitcoin. Surely, if these titans of industry are backing Bitcoin, then it can't be all bad. It can't be entirely worthless or used exclusively by criminals and money launderers. There has to be something more to it. And it gets even better from there. Simply associating Bitcoin with these TradFi giants would be a massive boost for its image. But those same companies will be actively advertising and advocating for Bitcoin to their clients. If the clamouring competitiveness ahead of the ETF launch was anything to go by, financial professionals from across the US are about to find themselves inundated with Bitcoin marketing material. That will surely boost people's understanding and opinion of Bitcoin. The biggest influence of all is going to be that of BlackRock and its chairman and CEO Larry Fink. The ETF launch wouldn't be a true paradigm shift without them. BlackRock exists on an almost unbelievable scale. Some even argue that they are an extension of the US government itself. The fact that they have put the time and effort into creating a Bitcoin ETF says something about Bitcoin. These guys don't play around. And it says even more when Larry Fink goes on TV and promotes Bitcoin like a true Bitcoiner, describing it as a digital gold and flight to quality asset. When Larry Fink says something, people tend to listen, and then follow his lead. For example, he pretty much kickstarted the financial world's focus on ESG assets by publicly embracing them in 2018. His decision to stop using that term marked the pivot back to oil, gas and energy security investments following the invasion of Ukraine. So now that he's backing Bitcoin, it wouldn't be surprised to see others following him once again. At the start of the last bull cycle, the legendary fund manager and macro trader Paul Tudor Jones called Bitcoin the fastest horse in the race against inflation and monetary debasement. That brought a significant sense of legitimacy to Bitcoin, and it gave other macro traders permission to discuss Bitcoin and its place in their portfolios. Larry Fink is now fulfilling that same role, but with orders of magnitude more importance and influence. It's clear that the ETF brings some sizable benefits to Bitcoin. Benefits that should, in theory, expand its appeal and drive the price higher. But you can also argue that the ETF is something of a poison chalice. After all, isn't the ETF entirely antithetical to Bitcoin's original values and intentions? That's certainly a point that many of Bitcoin's detractors and critics have been making in recent weeks, though a fair few supporters have said the same thing. And to an extent, they are correct. Bitcoin is very much the people's money. It was built to take power away from governments, central banks, and financial institutions. It was designed to eliminate reliance on third-party companies, instead enabling sovereign individuals, giving people complete control and ownership of their assets. Therefore, packaging Bitcoin in a product offered by financial giants like BlackRock raises an inevitable sense of irony. But there's a degree of nuance here that is often overlooked. Being a sovereign individual doesn't mean you must take full possession and control of your Bitcoin. It means you have the choice, ability, and freedom to do that, just as you have the choice, ability, and freedom to let a financial institution hold that Bitcoin for you. I strongly believe in the principles of self-custody. I think it's one of Bitcoin's greatest innovations and a feature that should be preserved at all costs. But I also recognise that it's not right for everybody, and that a broad spectrum of custodial solutions should be available including solutions where Bitcoin is little more than an IOU in an ETF wrapper. After all, the existence of those alternative solutions does nothing to diminish Bitcoin or detract from its values. Additionally, 
Bitcoin is an open and permissionless financial system that is owned equally by everybody and nobody. On one hand, that does mean it's the people's money, but at the same time, it makes it equally accessible and usable to financial institutions. At the end of the day, anyone can use it however they like. Anyone can build products and services around it, including companies like BlackRock. It belongs to them just as much as it belongs to us. And crucially, Bitcoin does not become immediately dependent on somebody just because they're using it or building products around it. Nor does it treat them specially or differently from anyone else, even if they are an incredibly wealthy and powerful financial organisation. There's certainly a chance that Bitcoin is captured and altered beyond recognition by these companies. We'll touch on that in a moment, but it's by no means a certainty. With all of that in mind, it's pretty clear that it would be oversimplifying things to say that Bitcoin has somehow sold out or lost itself with the launch of these ETFs. Plus, it would be totally unrealistic to expect Bitcoin to continue its growth in a vacuum, without ever gaining the support of some tradfi giants. Their support was inevitable if Bitcoin was ever to fulfil its ambitions of becoming a widely used and respected financial asset. Yes, there's an undeniable sense of incongruity in seeing Bitcoin tamed and wrapped up in products offered by some of Wall Street's biggest firms, but that's not necessarily a betrayal of its core values. However, it does raise some questions about Bitcoin's future. For example, there are some questions about the impact of the ETF issuers on Bitcoin's governance. In some cases, these firms might want to support the maintenance and development of Bitcoin. In fact, Bitwise and Vanek are already donating a portion of their ETF fees to Brink to help fund Bitcoin developers. This is likely the start of a trend of institutions building on and contributing to crypto development, just as they are already doing with open source projects like Linux. To an extent, this is a good thing. Long-term developer funding has always been a concern around any crypto project, especially Bitcoin but it also raises questions about how much influence these firms could gain. What if they were to push for developments that crypto natives and Bitcoiners find unpalatable? If the majority of Bitcoin developers are working for TradFi firms, then it may become difficult to oppose those changes. I'm sure that most of the developments they fund will not be sinister in the slightest. After all, any attempt to radically alter Bitcoin would almost certainly destroy its reputation and value. Plus, as far as I know, Linux has never been infiltrated and corrupted by evil corporate backers. However, that doesn't eliminate the concern entirely. Something that does help is the knowledge that any controversial change to Bitcoin would inevitably result in a chain split. But then that raises questions of its own. These TradFi giants would surely wield outsized influence in the event of any chain split, regardless of who caused it and why it's happening. Crypto natives will argue that it doesn't really matter what these companies do as long as users run their own nodes. By doing this, users define the specification and rules of the chain that they believe is real. Anything not conforming to those rules is ultimately irrelevant. The block size war proved that this was a very powerful mechanism for settling disputes. In that case, many crypto companies and exchanges stood against the community in their desire to increase Bitcoin's block size, and they ultimately lost. However, it's not clear if the same tactic would work against companies with the scale and resources of BlackRock. Yes, some individuals running nodes would continue to enforce their own version of Bitcoin, but that version would almost certainly be economically smaller and less secure than the Wall Street backed alternative. Plus, the general awareness of a breakaway blockchain would be much lower. I suspect that the vast majority of people would happily go along with whatever the big financial companies declared Bitcoin to be, blissfully unaware that alternatives existed. And even if they did know about the smaller fork, there would be little incentive for them to use it. Depending on your view, this could represent the death of Bitcoin. Others would disagree, arguing it doesn't matter what most people are doing and using. The alternative chain would continue to function as if nothing had happened, and therefore Bitcoin would live on. Maybe we'd even see history repeating itself, with Bitcoin's life playing out in cycles. Maybe the smaller, ideologically driven Bitcoin fork would steadily grow and gain momentum over the years, backed by everybody who wants to free themselves from Wall Street's tyranny, only to see it captured and commoditized once again. Of course, I'm being somewhat facetious, and maybe I'm overthinking an event that will never come to pass. But there is a definite risk here that should be taken seriously. It also makes me wonder, how much worse could such an event get? What if, say, running your own node was made illegal? In that case, there would be almost no defence against the capture of Bitcoin. Thankfully, such a law is incredibly unlikely to pass, at least in liberal democracies. But it's not totally inconceivable, especially if my next concern was ever realised. The ETF issuers are now stakeholders in the Bitcoin and crypto ecosystems, and while crypto natives will surely recoil at the idea, they are also representatives of the industry, at least to an extent, but they are by no means aligned with it. They don't hold the same values or beliefs as most crypto natives, and that makes for a particularly dangerous combination. Many countries are still in the early stages of regulating crypto, with relatively few examples of comprehensive, tailor-made crypto rules anywhere in the world. Lawmakers and regulators continue to consider and debate the best way forward, and far too frequently for my liking, they will sometimes make ill-judged or even malicious proposals 
that could cripple the industry in a given jurisdiction. This is where the influence of the TradFi giants comes in. Up until now, the industry has been incredibly effective at mobilising to fend off or amend harmful proposals, especially in the US. This has relied on the incredible efforts of industry advocates and lobbyists, but also on thousands of passionate individuals who have written to or called those in power and urged them to reconsider their rules. But what happens when colossal, highly respected and influential financial giants like BlackRock get in the middle of this? What happens when Larry Fink weighs in on policy discussions? Sadly, their opinions will likely hold much more weight than those of thousands of anonymous individuals. And as much as we can hope that they're on our side, they aren't likely to be arguing our case for us. Crypto natives tend to care deeply about maintaining open and permissionless standards. They tend to care about privacy and the right to self-custody assets. TradFi firms won't care about these things. If anything, they are incentivized to oppose them. As the biggest purveyors of highly controlled, permissioned and custodial crypto, they would be the big winners if true crypto was ever outlawed. Consider something like the Digital Asset Anti-Money Laundering Act. This bill, proposed by Elizabeth Warren, is seen by many crypto natives as a thinly veiled attempt to kill the industry in the US. The act intends to extend KYC requirements across almost every aspect of a crypto network, covering everything from validators and miners to wallet providers. However, many of those participants would never have access to the information that they need to satisfy the rules. It would be literally impossible for them to comply with it even if they wanted to. Despite its many flaws, it wouldn't be surprising to see TradFi firms supporting regulations like this. After all, if they offered any crypto products, they would be highly permissioned, KYC'd, and therefore largely unaffected by the rules. In fact, the Bank Policy Institute, a lobby group that represents Wall Street banks, have already shown support for this act. And that support will count for so much more if the banks providing it can also be considered industry participants. In fact, that would change the conversation entirely. While some rulemakers would still take the time to understand the issues at hand and the flaws of the act, others would look at the TradFi support and say, if these companies can meet the requirements with their crypto products, why can't everyone else? They wouldn't feel a need to dig any further, especially if the critics use the industry's resistance to the rules as some kind of evidence of the industry's unruly and crime-ridden nature that needs to be cleaned up. The political influence of these companies, combined with their ability to change the perception of our fight against draconian rules, means that the threat of harmful regulation cannot be underestimated, now more than ever before. For crypto's enemies, the entry of TradFi firms into the industry represents a new opportunity to push through destructive regulation, all while appearing reasonable and pragmatic enough to gain the support of the supposed industry representatives. Elizabeth Warren's act is incredibly unlikely to succeed, but other, similar proposals will be made and some of those will have a genuine chance of becoming law. When that happens, and the ETF issuers weigh in on the debate, then we'll finally find out if we've made a deal with the devil in getting these ETFs approved. While the potential impact on crypto's governance and regulation are my primary concerns, I've seen a few other issues that are worth mentioning. Some have highlighted that a single custodian, Coinbase, will be responsible for looking after most of the ETF's Bitcoin. That creates a giant honeypot for hackers and a massive single point of failure for Bitcoin. It's worth noting though that Coinbase custody has already held a lot of Bitcoin for a long time without any problems, so there's no reason to be particularly worried about this. The inflow of new Bitcoin wouldn't dramatically increase the risk of any incident, it would just worsen the impact of one. If anything were to go wrong at Coinbase or with any of the other custodians, then it would raise another intriguing scenario. Would the scale of the hack be enough to call for a rollback of the Bitcoin blockchain. Of course, they wouldn't be able to just click their fingers and demand a change, that's not how Bitcoin works, but they could offer a massive bounty to any miner willing to build an alternative history in which the hack never happened. The idea of an incentivized reorg was thrown around a few years ago after Binance was hacked. It didn't make sense at the time due to the size of the loss, the time since it had occurred, and the fact that it could damage Bitcoin's reputation and credibility. But would these TradFi firms, less enamored with Bitcoin's ideals like immutability, be more willing to give it a try? If the loss represented a significant portion of their AUM, it's certainly conceivable, and the question would then become, how much would Bitcoin's reputation suffer as a result? The other risk of holding so much Bitcoin in one place is that it makes it much easier to seize. Bitcoiners love to talk and worry about Executive Order 6102, which made gold ownership illegal in the US in 1933. While it's incredibly unlikely to happen today, I suppose it's possible to imagine some extreme form of financial repression that involves the confiscation of all hard assets. In that case, it would be easy for a government to seize any Bitcoin held through centralised entities like the ETFs. Again, I don't really think this is worth worrying about, not least because a world in which governments are seizing people's crypto is probably suffering from many, far worse problems as well at that time. But, as this would likely rank surprisingly high on many Bitcoiners' list of concerns, it felt right to include it. 
The final concern I've heard that is worth mentioning is that ETFs could represent the beginning of the final financialization of Bitcoin. Eventually, this could weaken Bitcoin's hard cap and dilute the supply through the creation of synthetic coins. The idea is that, as the TradFi world embraces crypto, it will introduce large-scale, leveraged products where Bitcoin are lent out and rehypothecated. This would lead to some people thinking that they owned Bitcoin that simply don't exist, something that they may not find out until disaster strikes and their IOU turns up worthless. While this concern is technically valid, it's neither new nor an immediate threat. None of the ETFs currently approved for trading are allowed to lend out their Bitcoin. They must hold them one for one. This will surely change down the line. At some point, Bitcoin will be heavily financialized and will likely suffer the consequences of this. But it's also an inevitable part of Bitcoin growing up and gaining widespread adoption. Plus, we've already seen some smaller examples of financialization and the dangers of it through the various Bitcoin banks that emerged and exploded in recent years. To me, all of these issues are worthy of brief consideration, but they pale in comparison to the more existential threats we discussed earlier. I've heard a few people describe the ETF as a kind of Trojan horse. Usually, the speaker is excited about the prospect of Bitcoin infiltrating the TradFi world, priming it to be disrupted and cryptoified. But the analogy works the other way too. Perhaps this is TradFi's way of infiltrating and taming crypto. The ETFs are certainly worth getting excited about. They've brought Bitcoin into the big leagues, making it more accessible and respectable than ever before. They've also given massively influential players like Larry Fink an opportunity to start promoting Bitcoin, potentially leading to the biggest orange pilling moment in all of crypto's history. They're clearly a big deal, and if nothing else, they should be beneficial to Bitcoin's price over the next few years. But they also bring new risks, threatening to pacify Bitcoin's cypherpunk nature and corrupt its ideals in worst case scenarios. While we're all joyous today, we could be watching the beginning of Bitcoin's downfall. For those of us that care about more than just number go up, the next few years could be the most critical and future defining in the industry's entire history. We may need to work harder than ever before to preserve the things we value in this technology, and to ensure all of its essential features remain legal and accessible to all. Some might argue that the ETF approval represents a kind of endpoint, a victory over TradFi and the SEC. I can't help but think this is just a beginning. Yes, a beginning of a new era in which Bitcoin is more widely held and respected than ever before, but also the beginning of a new battle for the future of crypto and for the future of the digital and financial worlds as a whole. So that's it for today. Let me know your thoughts on the ETF approvals in the comments below. Am I overthinking the risks here or do you have concerns of your own? And if you're not totally fed up of ETF chat yet, then you can check out my thoughts on the potential ETH ETF approvals which I've written up on Mirror. There's also a small rant about the SEC and Gary Gensler. I think I'm also now required to say that none of this is investment advice or advice of any kind. It's purely my thoughts and opinions. I'm not suggesting you buy Bitcoin or any other crypto asset. And if you do choose to buy those, whether through an ETF or in a crypto native way, you risk losing everything. And with that, I will say thank you very much for watching. Have a great day and I will see you in the next video.